I said, does your God have normal physical relations with those wives and beget spirit babies in heaven? They said, yeah, we believe he does. I said, now do you guys believe that if the spirit baby is a valiant spirit baby, if it's a good spirit baby in heaven, when it comes to earth, it gets a white skinned body. But if it's a bad spirit baby, it gets a black skinned body. Is that what you believe? They said, well, uh, <clears throat> you're not supposed to know that, but uh, yeah, that is what we believe. <laughs> By the way, that is what they believe. I said, now fellas, let me see if I understand this. Now, <clears throat> your God in heaven supplies a spirit baby for every human baby born on earth. Is that right? They said, that's right. I said, okay, fellas, now listen. <clears throat> I know you have the little tag that says elder, even though you're 17. But uh, <clears throat> I said, fellas, I've been married uh, 30 years now. I've got three kids. I've got grandkids. I, have, uh, I taught biology and anatomy. I used to raise hamsters. I said, did you know there are two babies born every second? <clears throat> two per second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I said, and your God supplies a spirit for every one. Uh, when does he get time to answer your prayers? Boy, they knocked the dust off their feet, and I guess I was anathema from then on, because they never came back, <laughs> brother. I don't know. I wanted to talk to them some more, but they didn't want to talk to me no more. <laughs> That's a dumb idea that you get black spirit babies up in <laughs> spirit babies in heaven. This is dumb. This is crazy, okay? It's not true. We're all equal. This Mormon apostle said, um, in a broad sense, caste systems have their root and origin in the gospel. It's by divine decree. He said, Cain, Ham, and the whole Negro race have been cursed with black skin, the mark of Cain. That is just silly, okay? This uh, Mormon apostle said, if there's one drop of Negro blood in my children, as I've read to you, they receive the curse. The curse of black skin. That's dumb. He said, shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. By the way, you ought to read the book, The Secret History of the Mormon Church. Get the phone number there. Go to the website, UTLM, UtahLighthouseMission.org. If you want to get all the lowdown on the, how the Mormons have killed people for trying to leave the Mormon Church or for marrying someone who's not the right color. Now, I know I'm in the South, and I preach the same message all over the South, but if you think you're superior because of the color of your skin, you're wrong, you're stupid, and you're not right with God. Amen. Okay, I have brought thousands of black people to the Lord, and I intend to keep doing it, okay? <laughs> And they're going to be in heaven whether you like it or not. <laughs> but during the slave trade time in America here, the slaves were packed onto ships and brought over like cows. I mean, it was common for 20% of them to die. They would bring them on the ship and chain them to the deck, and that's where they stayed for two or three weeks. I mean, they ate, slept, and went to the bathroom, same place, for two or three weeks. They didn't get up. Brought them over. Miserable, miserable conditions they brought them into. And then sold them over here like cows. Now, praise God for the good people who tried to take care of them. You know, some people really were good to their slaves. But the whole concept of slavery is based on the idea that one person is superior because of the color of his skin or because of what he believes. This is based, goes right back to the evolution teaching. Now, some people thought the aborigines from Australia were inferior because they have bigger jaw bones, which is true. Their jaws are bigger. If you study the jaw of an aboriginal, the, the bone structure is heavier. And people say, see, that's proof of evolution. No, it's not. The Aborigines are a nomadic society. They don't want to carry a toolbox around. So they carry the minimum with them. And when they get to where they got to go, they have to make their own tools again. And they use their teeth as a vice. They're constantly using their jaws as well as their hands, anything they've got, okay? And any bodybuilder will tell you, the more you build your muscles, the bigger the bones grow. So a person who's always using his jaws, his masseter muscles, is going to end up with bigger bones in response to that. After a lifetime of using your teeth like they do, you're going to have big jaw bones. It's got nothing to do with evolution. But somebody noticed this back 150 years ago and said, wow, the Aborigines have bigger jaw bones. So they went over and began robbing the graves of the Aborigines to get their heads for museums to be demonstrations for evolution. They treated the Aborigines awful. If you've seen the movie Quigley Down Under, where he brought people over there just to shoot the Aborigines, that kind of stuff really happened. They thought they were just, you know, an animal. These two folks went to Australia to collect specimens for museums. Interesting story here in Creation Magazine. It said right here, a New South Wales missionary was the horrified witness to the slaughter by mounted police of a group of dozens of Aboriginal men, women, and children. Forty-five heads were then boiled down and the best ten skulls packed off for overseas. They shot them just to get their heads for a museum displays. Now why would a museum want a head with a bigger jawbone? As part of an evolution display. 
Did you know the Smithsonian, I've been told, has 33,000 sets of human remains in their basement right now? They call it the Army of the Potomac. They would find people with the right jaw structures and put them on display in their museum. See, boys and girls, how this ape evolved to the human? When the intermediates, there's another human. You can go downtown Pensacola and line up 10 people and prove the same thing, folks. We could line up folks in this room. Some of you have bigger jaws and smaller jaws and sloped forehead and straight forehead. I had an Italian friend one time. I said, man, look at, I got to look at you from the side. You, I could put you in a textbook, you know? <laughs> his head went back like that. His nose stuck out. I said, you're the perfect missing link. <laughs> guy had an IQ way up there in the stratosphere. Brilliant guy. Just had a dumb looking head, you know? <laughs> And by the way, the size of the head has got nothing, the brain has nothing to do with intelligence either. There have been some incredibly high IQ people with brain sizes down around 1200 cc. And there have been some really dumb people with some really big heads with 2000 cc brains, okay? It's got nothing to do with intelligence. America, though, during this early, late 1800s, because of the evolution theory primarily, had a large eugenics movement. Eugenics was the idea that we need to purify the race, get rid of the inferior genes, and only let the superior genes produce children. There was actually a sterilization movement. People who were mentally deficient were often sterilized. They couldn't have any children. There was a large eugenics movement until World War II broke out. Galton was Darwin's cousin and Galton was very, Francis Galton, very influential in the eugenics movement. He said, is the study of the agencies under social control, it is the study, eugenics is the study of the agencies under social control to, that improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. That's Darwin's cousin. Now let's improve the race. Here's, one of their, here's their logo and their motto, the tree of eugenics. Eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. They're going to use medicine, surgery, psychiatry, sociology, religion, education, genealogy. They use it all. Like a tree, eugenics draws its materials from many sources and organizes them into a harmonious entity. They were going to work really hard to improve humanity by eliminating inferior genes. This, this is a person very involved in this was uh, the one who started Planned Parenthood. We cover more on that on video number four. In 1904, the World's Fair was held in St. Louis, Missouri. One of the displays on there was a huge display of many people involved in showing the evolution theory. Right here's a picture. At the 1904 World's Fair, 2,000 primitive peoples were put on display. The purpose of the display was to demonstrate the superiority of the white Americans who had evolved further. Peter Jennings, liberal Peter Jennings, <laughs> wrote, that, wrote a book and mentioned this in there. And in, if you go to the St. Louis Zoo today, that is on the place where the World's Fair was held, and they're still using some of those same buildings. There in St. Louis at the 1904 World's Fair, they had a man in a cage with chimpanzees to demonstrate the evolution theory. The man was a pygmy from Australia. A pygmy from Africa, a little bitty pygmy, about four foot five, I think he was. Ota Benga was his name. Ota had a wife and two kids. They put him in a cage with chimpanzees. He went insane and killed himself. Why, did, why would they do that to somebody? Well, if you believe in evolution, man's just an animal. Even President Roosevelt, as good a man as he was in many ways, was caught up into this false thinking. Roosevelt thought that the Indians were an inferior species. Roosevelt said, I wish very much the wrong people could be prevented entirely from breeding. Roosevelt thought the immigrants from Europe, Scotland, Ireland, and the Orient were a threat to American society. How many of you have ancestors from one of those places? <laughs> Just about everybody in the room. Yep, you're a threat to American society because you have inferior genes. That's what he thought. In 1871, Congress scrapped all treaties with the Indians and moved them off to the reservation system still in use today. They made promises to the Indians and broke them. After all, they're only savages, they're inferior. The Trail of Tears took place before Darwin's book came out, but still evolution was very much taught before Darwin's book. Darwin just simply made it popular. But in the Trail of Tears, the Cherokee Indians were moved off their land by force to Oklahoma. About a third of them died along the way. Sam Houston married a Cherokee bride. He was really upset about what's going on with the white people picking on these Indians for no, no reason other than they th thought they were an inferior species, which goes right back to the evolution teaching. 
When they took the Indians out of uh, Ross's Landing, Tennessee, they moved the Indians out two weeks before harvest time. They did all the work, planted the crops, tended them all summer long, just before harvest time, came in with soldiers and guns, loaded them into wagons, and moved them out. And of course, the white people moved into their houses, already made, you know, crops ready to harvest. Man, pretty nice. So people would forget about what happened, this horrible slaughter of the Indians. They renamed the city. It used to be called Ross's Landing after Chief Ross. Now they call it Chattanooga. Renamed to honor or to make people forget what happened. Here's an article from Franklin College in Franklin, Indiana. The Carnegie Institute of Washington, Eugenics Record Office, founded by Mrs. E. H. Harriman. Anybody heard that name before? E. H. Harriman. How many saw Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? He's getting ready to blow up the train, you know, and he said, I work for Mr. E. H. Harriman. Super rich gazillionaire back in those days very much involved in wanting to improve humanity by eliminating the inferior. Carnegie started the organization, <clears throat> now in Berserkley, California, that fights to keep creation out of schools. It's his funding that supplied the start of that organization. The whole idea that man is superior, <laughs> there's a bunch of guys been involved in this. The Bible says, have we not all one father? You're not superior because of the color of your skin. The Bible says, He hath made of one blood all nations of men to rule on the earth. Now Darwin thought that a married man was a poor slave, worse than a Negro. Regardless, we won't comment on whether it's true or not, but uh, if, <laughs> it's not by the way, but if a professor said that today, how long would he keep his job? Or his life? Some of these feminazis would go kill him, wouldn't they? <laughs> um, and yet they praised Darwin in our school system. Louisiana, I don't know if they got it passed or not, they were working on a bill to ban the teaching of Darwin because of his racism. Very interesting approach. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if our school started teaching the teachings of Adolf Hitler and made it mandatory reading, wouldn't people get upset? Well, why aren't they upset about the mandatory teaching of Darwinism? Hmm? Darwin said, the chief distinction between, of intellectual powers between the two sexes is shown by man's attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up. Whether requiring deep thought, reason, or imagination, or merely the use of the senses and hands, the average mental power in man must be above that of woman. Darwin finally married his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood. Nobody else would take him. Darwin thought men were superior in every single way. Darwin believed in inbreeding, so he married Emma, his first cousin. He wanted to raise a superior stock of children. He ended up having ten children. Mary died shortly after birth. Anne died at ten. Robert was born retarded and died at 19 months. Henrietta had a serious nervous breakdown at 15. Three of his other six sons were ill so often, Charles regarded them as semi-invalids. So much for inbreeding, Charlie. Evolution is the foundation for communism. Communism, started by a guy named Karl Marx, removes God from authority and puts man in his place. He says, there is no God, so man must be in charge. Missionaries have said, when they're, when they're working in a country and the communists take over, the first thing the communists do when they come into the country, they go into the schools and they start teaching communism? No. They start teaching evolution. They start by laying a foundation of evolution, and then they bring in the teachings of communism. Communism can't thrive in a place where people believe they've got rights from, come, that come from the Creator. And the creation movement in America is one of the biggest hindrances to the advancement of the New World Order. And they very much would like to get rid of guys like me who don't believe in uh, evolution. The guy who founded the ACLU, the American Communist Lawyers Union, or the Anti-Christian Lawyers Union, whatever it is, Roger Baldwin said communism is the goal. You ought to read the history of the founding of the ACLU. One of the purposes of that lawyers movement was to advance the cause of communism. Karl Marx, whose name, a real name was Moses Mordecai Marx Levy, alias Karl Marx, when he was 17 years old, he wrote a beautiful paper telling how much he loved the Lord. High school graduation, he had a paper saying, man, I want to serve God with my life. Then he went off to college. He studied philosophy, and a college professor turned him away from God and turned him on to the teaching of evolution and destroyed Marx's whole philosophy of life. Karl Marx was destroyed by this teaching. 
You know, 75% of kids from Christian homes that go off to secular schools lose their faith. I meet them by the hundreds all year long. Some college professor destroys their faith. Karl Marx later in life said, My objective in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. Marx based his whole philosophy of communism on the idea of evolution. Karl Marx even tried to dedicate his book to Charles Darwin from a sincere admirer, Karl Marx. Marx knew his theories would not survive without evolution as the foundation philosophy. They go together hand in glove. Karl Marx had six children. Three died of starvation in infancy. Two others committed suicide. When Marx died, only six people attended his funeral. But his philosophy is still ruling one-third of the planet today. You know, one-third of the people on planet Earth are under communism right now. Started by a loser who never worked a day in his life, let his own kids starve to death. He was a loser. Karl Marx developed what we call the Communist Manifesto in 1848. You want to take over a country? Here's how communism works. First thing you do is abolish private property. And by the way, this is the real purpose behind the environmental movement in America. They're not trying to save the environment. Some probably are. But the basic idea behind the movement is abolish private property. You've got to get their permit to cut down your tree. That's where it's headed, folks. The Bible talks about private property ownership quite a bit. You know, every 50 years you got your property back. You could not lose it forever. Your family's going to get it back. If you're a loser, you're lazy or whatever, you don't, get, you don't you know, pay your bills and they take it away, your family will get it back every 50th year. The Bible talks about having his own vine and his own fig tree. Drink water out of your own cistern, running waters out of their own well. You know, the solution to pollution in America is private property ownership. Ask anybody that's ever owned a house and rented it out to somebody else. They will understand. Renters don't look at property the same way owners do. How many know what I'm talking about? Okay, there you go. And the more property the government owns, the worse pollution is going to get. Peter Burrell, the president of the National Audubon Society, said, We reject the idea of private property. Well, he's got a good communist philosophy along with Bill Clinton and Hillary. Here's a pledge of allegiance put up at a public school in Massachusetts. Look at this carefully. I pledge allegiance to the earth which I do love and depend on, and to all life and land, air and sea, which is as much a part of earth as me. At a third grade school in Wisconsin, here's the pledge the kids say, I pledge allegiance to the world, to care for earth, sea and air, to honor every living thing with peace and justice everywhere. Three days ago I was speaking in Minnesota, and I got to see this young man again who's now grown up, but he told me a couple of years ago, he, Jacob did, he said, Brother Hoven, when I was in third grade at Johnson, Ele Johnsonville, Johnsville Elementary School in Blaine, Minnesota, his teacher, Ms. Club Hockey, took down the American flag and made the kids pledge to the earth instead. Well, Ms. Club Hockey, I will buy you a one-way ticket to the Soviet Union on the condition you use it and you don't come back. Yeah. Call me anytime. We'll, I'll buy you one. I've been to communist countries, folks. Trust me, you don't want what they've got. Now, America has lots of problems, I understand. But I love my country, folks. I fear my government, but I love my country. There are basically two philosophies of government. One is based on evolution thinking, which says laws come from man's opinion. How do you decide right from wrong? Oh, man gets together and we decide. Second thing, they say rights are granted by the government, and the government should be the provider. The government provides everything. This is called a democracy. Democracies always become dictatorships. They are horrible forms of government. The government should provide everything. When they were debating about health care here in Pensacola, I heard on the radio you know, several years ago talking about a national health care plan. I thought, did you know 70 to 80 percent of all health care costs are from self-induced problems? Somebody wants to drink or smoke or take drugs, and when they get sick, they want me to pay for it? They were debating on the radio here, and one of the WCOA, I think it was, talking about, should we have a national health care plan? I called in. I said, I think it was Luke I got. I said, hey, Luke, I think we should have a, uh, I got an idea here. I forget how I started off. I said, I said, I forgot to change oil in my car, and I blew the engine. I think everybody should help me pay for it. They said, well, if you forgot to change oil and you blew your engine, that's your problem. I said, well, this is exactly the same idea with health care. If you don't want to take care of your health, I guess that's your business. But if you get sick, why should I have to pay for it? 
If you don't want to brush your teeth and floss your teeth, that's oh, you do whatever you want. They're your teeth, but I'm not going to pay you to get you new ones. <laughs> i got to take care of my own too, you know. If we're going to have universal health care, why not universal auto care? If you ever damage your car, the government will pay for it. <laughs> How's that for an idea? How about universal house care? You got a problem with your house, you need new doors, you need new carpet, hey, the government will pay for it. How about the government pay all utility bills? You don't have to yell at your kids anymore. Shut the refrigerator. <coughs> Do you realize what would happen in a hurry? The whole system would crumble. That's what the Canadians are just now trying to figure out. Wow, how come it's costing us so much for this health care? <laughs> I haven't had any health insurance now for 14 years. I take my vitamins. A lot of them. I probably spend 40, 50 bucks a month on vitamins and nutrition for me and my wife. Oh, that's a lot of money. Oh, cheaper than 400 a month for health insurance, isn't it? And boy, when you get sick, it's, it's neat. You go to the hospital, they have to do something, you know, some kind of surgery. I remember one of my boys had surgery, and uh, the hospital bill was like $4,500, you know, for two hours in, the, in an outpatient place. So I called the different people. I called the anesthesiologist. I said, hello, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I noticed your bill here is $1,500 for an hour and a half, you know, putting him to sleep. Uh, I don't have any insurance. I do pay my bills, and I'll pay whatever I have to, but that seems kind of high for an hour and a half, you know. He said, oh, you don't have insurance? Okay, let's make it 300 <laughs> Just like that over the phone. I called the place, the place that had the room, you know. I'm sure they had to change the sheets and put some new Band-Aids out and stuff, you know. And I said, listen, I saw your bill here was like, you know, $1,800. That seems kind of high for an hour and a half, you know, for your room. He said, I, said, I don't have any insurance. He said, oh, you don't? Okay, let's make it 400 I got the bill down from, I think, 4500 down to about 1000 just over the phone with five phone calls. <laughs> You don't have insurance? Oh, okay. The more people have insurance, the more it raises the price of everything. Now, I'm not against health insurance, okay, but I'm saying the philosophy here is what's important to understand. We got this crazy idea that the government's supposed to provide everything. Well, they'll be glad to do that, but along with that, they're going to take away all your freedoms. Our founding father said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. For instance, who gives you the right to have a church? Then why do we ask the government for permission? You know, just about every church in America now has become 501c3 corp incorporated because they want to get a government handout. <coughs> you ought to get the book Hush Money or the bigger version of it, In Caesar's Grip by Peter Kershaw, a good friend of mine. You want to find out all the dangers of 501c3 incorporation. The church doesn't have to get incorporated, but if you do get incorporated, you better not preach against certain things from your pulpit. Did you know if you're an incorporated church and you preach against homosexuality, the IRS will pull your tax-exempt status? Churches are tax-exempt anyway. <laughs> what are we asking them that for? Come on. I'll read the book if you want more on that. Patrick Henry said, It cannot be emphasized too strongly that this great nation was founded by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, the other philosophy of government is based on creation thinking, which says laws come from the Creator, rights are unalienable, and the government should be limited to the punishment of evildoers and defense, the only two legitimate functions of government. They're not supposed to provide everything for you. You ought to read Davy Crockett's story about, he's out, you know, a house, a neighborhood burned in Washington, D.C. when Davy Crockett was senator or something like that. And the senators got together and said, you know, this whole neighborhood burned, what a horrible tragedy, everybody lost their house here. Let's vote to give this neighborhood, you know, $50,000, whatever it was way back then, you know, to rebuild their homes. The next fall, Davy Crockett's out stumping, trying to get people to vote for him. And he saw this farmer plowing his field, and he stopped and said, Hey, neighbor. The farmer stopped and said, Yes, sir, can I help you? He said, I'm Davy Crockett. He said, Yes, sir, I know who you are. He said, Well, I want to see if you vote for me. The farmer said, No, sir, I'll never vote for you again in my life. He said, Well, why not? He said, You broke your trust. He said, I voted for you last time to put you in there to manage things for our, our, our area, and, uh, and you blew it. He said, well, how did I blow it? What did I do? He said, well, you voted to give those people money to rebuild their houses. Crockett said, well, yeah, that was a horrible thing that happened. You know, a big fire swept through the community or something. And the farmer said, are you going to do this for every tragedy across America? What if I lose my crop? What if my cow dies? Are you, what, there's, this is a slippery slope, folks. There's no way out of this one. You have no business to give away our money. Now, if you congressmen want to get together and pool your money and give those folks some money, you go ahead. We've even trusted you to manage our money. We've got the whole story. It's amazing. If you call us or email us, we'll send that to you. Davy Crockett said, boy, he learned his lesson. 
but the senators and representatives today do not understand that lesson. They love giving away your money. Long story on that. A republic, though, is based on the idea that the law is supreme. Our, our government started off to be a constitutional republic, not a democracy. And I get real nervous when I hear them talk about spread democracy around the world. That'd be the dumbest thing we could do. <laughs> talk about a dumb form of government. The second part of Karl Marx's plan was a heavy progressive income tax. Don't get me started on that one, okay? The third thing he said was abolish the rights of inheritance. The Bible says a good man leaves inheritance to his children's children. Everything about communism is backwards to the biblical plan for things. Second, for, number four, confiscate property rights. Take away the property. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Karl Marx said we need a central bank. He knew full well a central bank could destroy the country. And in 1913, some rich guys got together on Jekyll Island, Georgia, and tricked everybody with the Federal Reserve. Nothing federal about it, and there are no reserves. The Federal Reserve is a private bunch of bankers. Remember, love of money is root of all evil. We've got a whole lot more on that in our college class, CSE 103. Number six, government ownership of communication. That's why we have an FCC, Federal Communication Commission. And government ownership of transportation. That's why we now have the TSA, the Transportation Security Administration. I go to the airports. I flew 175 times last year. I'll break that this year. I go to the airports, and there'll be 50 people standing around, you know, to check everything. I went once and they took my fingernail clipper out, this big. It had a little thing that swings out to clean your fingernails. They said, oh, can't have that. They broke it off. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. I'm going to take over a plane with a fingernail clipper. <laughs> They're paranoid. Number seven, government ownership of factories and agriculture. Number eight, government control of labor. Number nine, corporate farms and regional planning. Number ten, free education. You know the public school idea came from Karl Marx. Now, there were public schools before that, I understand, but Karl Marx said the government should do a free education for everybody. Well, my PhD is in education. My mom taught for years and retired. My brother's in his 34th year now teaching public school. I speak in hundreds and hundreds of schools across the world. Folks, I'm for education, but I'm dead set against government involvement in education. The government's got no business being involved in education at all. You better read your Constitution, the Tenth Amendment. Unless that's spelled out in that document, the government shouldn't do it. We've gotten a long ways away from that. Hitler said, you let me control the textbooks, I'll control the state. Martin Luther said, I am much afraid that the schools will prove to be the great gates to hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the scriptures, engraving them in the hearts of youth. He said, I would advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution <clears throat> in which men are not unceasingly, increasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. Well, go walk the halls of the schools, folks. I'm telling you, they have become corrupt. Here's a 1777 public school book, first grade. Here's what they taught the kids in first grade in America. Used in public, private schools. It's a first grade textbook. Here's how they learned the alphabet. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. Back then they made the S like a letter F, okay? Heaven to find the Bible mind. Christ crucified for sinners died. The deluge drowned the earth around. Elijah hid, the ravens fed. The judgment made Felix afraid. Public school textbook. Interesting. Here's how the youth, young people, learned their alphabet. A wise son maketh a glad father. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Come unto, the, unto Christ, all ye that labor and heavy laden. Do not the abominable thing which I hate, saith the Lord. That's a public school textbook, folks. Guess what they teach the kids today? You're an animal. Share a common heritage with earthworms. Here's a textbook that has over 100 pages devoted to evolution theory. Not one mention of creation or God any place in the book. Not one. What has happened, folks? The United Nations has already declared. They had a world declaration on education for all in 1990. Called for the nations of the world to adopt a common education system complete with implementation timetables and recommended curriculum. In our own nation, Goals 2000, School to Work, and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, Profiles of Learning, are totally consistent with the One World Government recommendations of the 1990 UN Declaration. You ought to get hold of Bob Fry in Minnesota. We'll put his address up here and you can call Bob about more stuff on the 
he's very involved in fighting this type of thing right here. A humanist said in the Humanist Magazine, uh, John Dunfrey said, the battle for mankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their roles as proselytizers of a new faith that will replace the rotting corpse of Christianity. This guy said, every child who enters school at age five is mentally ill because he comes to school with allegiance toward our elected officials, founding fathers, institutions, government, patriotism, nationalism, sovereignty. All these prove the child is sick because the Welch individual is one who has rejected all those things and is what I call the true international child, communist, of the future. Dr. Pierce from Harvard University. Well, Dr. Pierce, I'll buy you a one-way ticket also to the Soviet Union if you use it and don't come back. I've been over there, folks. You don't want what they've got. Here's a social science book, public school book. They said, any child who believes in God is mentally ill. Education is the most powerful ally of humanism, and every American public school is a school of humanism. What can the theistic Sunday school, meeting for an hour once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children, do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching? They're right, folks, and they're winning. We're losing. One professor said, as a matter of fact, creationism should be discriminated against. No advocate of such propaganda should be trusted to teach science classes or administer science programs anywhere, under any circumstances. Moreover, if they are now doing so, they should be dismissed. You should fire them if they believe in creation. An Iowa professor said, you should fail any student, no matter what the grade record indicate, if the professor discovers the student is a creationist. Furthermore, the student's department should have the right of retracting the grades and possibly even degrees if the student becomes a creationist later. That's the kind of thinking we're up against. Mr. Yefremov lives here in Pensacola. He came to my house several years ago. He's from Ukraine. He said, Dr. Hoven, here's my high school diploma. I said, yeah. You know, you're 50 years old. You got five kids, a couple of, you know, four in college. Uh, why are you handing me your high school diploma? He said, when I was in Ukraine, I went to school, had good grades. They grade them one, two, three, four, five, five's the best. He showed me his report card, all fives, like straight A's. He said, but we had a test to take before we could graduate. Senior year in high school, one of the questions on the test was, do you believe in evolution? I answered, no. They refused to let me graduate. I said, well, how'd you get the diploma? He said, oh, you remember last year when we made your videotapes in Russian? And he did the voice on them? I said, yeah. He said, I sent them to my village where I grew up in Russia. The mayor watched them, made all the city council watch the tapes. And they said, wow, Eugene went to America and became a movie star. <laughs> <laughs> they put him in the public school to make all the public school kids watch him. The kid who was there, the, 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 the guy who refused to let him get his diploma 35 years ago, had now become a city councilman. And the mayor said, uh, go ahead and send him his diploma. Okay, yes, sir. He said, I just got my diploma in the mail. What do you think, Brother Hoven? I said, wow. <laughs> what a story. See, the humanists have decided years ago they're going to use the education system to spread their evolution in humanism because that way we pay for it. We're paying to spread their religion. That's what's going on, folks. Communism is anti-Christian in every single way. The communists have eight rules for revolution, different ways, different things they want to do to take over a country. We don't have time to go over them all now. I have to cover that some other time. Or get our college class, CSE 103, where we cover this in much more detail. Evolution is the foundation philosophy for Nazism. Why did Hitler do what he did? Well, we'll cover that tomorrow night. It's the foundation for Nazism, communism, socialism, Marxism, and the New World Order. Coming soon. We'll talk about that tomorrow night. Very politically incorrect. You don't want to come tomorrow. And then we'll tell you what you can do about it. Amen. Coming next. Well, welcome to the last session on our, what's on our videotape number five about the effects of the evolution theory. How that evolution is responsible for the rise of communism, Marxism, socialism. And tonight we're going to talk about Nazism, the last one, and then the New World Order. Then we're going to tell you, what do you do about it? Our world is quite obviously falling apart. What are we going to do? Nazism is based on the philosophy of evolution. You have to think one race is superior to another. Uh, Mussolini, the Italian dictator, thought that the Italians were the superior race and everybody else should be eliminated. Of course, Hitler felt the same way. He thought the Germans were the superior race. He believed in Aryan supremacy. 
Hitler believed the Germans were the superior race that deserved to rule the world. Everybody else was just taking up room. The German Fuhrer consistently sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. This fellow said a direct line runs from Darwin through the father of eugenics movement, Darwin's cousin Francis Galton, to the extermination camps of Nazi Europe. Exactly right. In Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, you can read his racist philosophy. It just kind of oozes off every page. Adolf Hitler's mind was captivated by evolutionary thinking, probably since he was a boy. Evolutionary ideas lie at the basis of all that is worst in Mein Kampf and in his speeches. Hitler offered to send the Jews to anybody who would take them. He said, you want these Jews? I'll send them to you. you I read a lot about Hitler and the Holocaust. You ought to read the book, While Six Million Died, and see what the rest of the world did. Did you know Hitler offered to send the Jews to America and Roosevelt refused to let him? Unbelievable what happened, folks, during World War, before World War II. In Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, on page 286 in this edition, he said, even less does nature desire the blending of a higher with a lower race. Who's a higher and a lower race, Adolf? Hitler kept talking about the Aryan blood and lower peoples. Well, who's an Aryan, anyway? Well, I found Hitler's hit list. I was reading in University, uh, Keene State University, New Hampshire. I was doing some research in their library there one time, and I found uh, they got a whole section of the library just about Hitler and the Holocaust. I thought, wow, I was in hog heaven. So I asked the librarian, why did Hitler kill the Jews? Why not somebody else? He said, oh, I'll show you the list he was using. He brought me book after book after book. For six hours, I copied $20 worth of pages, 10 cents at a time, out of that library. Here's the list Hitler was using. Hitler thought the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Nordic were close to pure Aryan, the superior race. Did you get all that? Blonde hair, blue eyed, Norwegian, born in Star Atelier Dog. Yeah, sure, you betcha. Oofta. And he thought the Germans were mostly Aryan. The Mediterraneans are slightly Aryan. The Slavics are half Aryan, half ape. The Orientals are slightly ape. The black Africans are predominantly ape. And the Jews are close to pure ape. Hitler killed the Jews because he honestly thought he was speeding up the process of evolution by eliminating what he thought were the inferiors. If he would have killed all the Jews, guess who would have been next? Blacks. Hitler hated black people. Does anybody know where the Olympics were held in uh, 1936? Berlin, Germany. Uh, does anybody know who won the most gold medals? Jesse Owens, the black American athlete. Hitler was so angry, he said, it's not fair to make my men race against this animal. One of the Jewish prisoners who survived the Holocaust said, there is a difference between those who look upon their fellow human beings as common creatures of a common creator and those who look upon them of a conglomerate of biologicals and chemicals. Hey, is man just a bunch of chemicals that got together by chance over billions of years, or were we designed by a creator? That is a fundamental difference, folks. So that's the difference between creation and evolution right there. By the way, the Jewish Talmud, not the Torah, which is the Old Testament, the Talmud teaches that anybody who's not Jewish should be killed. It says the Talmud says all non-Jews are to be exterminated. All Gentile children are animals. Even the best of the Gentiles should be killed. You'd be surprised how many religions in the world teach that they are the only one, not just the only one that's going to heaven, but the only one that deserves to live. You ought to read the, what the Muslims teach. You know, official Muslim doctrine is, according to Islam, you can read about the, the prophet, a great little book here if you want to read about how the, the start of the Muslim church, or about who is this Allah anyway. These are books we offer in our ministry. You can get these through our bookstore downtown here. Or Islamic Invasion by Robert Morey. Oh, man, tremendous book on exposing what the Islam people really believe, or this one just new out by Don Boy's excellent book on Islam, America's Trojan Horse. Did you know the Torah, I mean not the Torah, the uh, Koran clearly teaches if a person will not convert, they should, they have to be executed. Here's the Koran uh, in Surah 489, Allah commands that any person who leaves Islam or encourages others to do so should be seized and slain. Allah told Muhammad that all, his, all those who opposed his message should be killed, or they should be nailed to a tree, or their hands and legs should be cut off. You cannot be a good Muslim without being a revolutionary. You have to hate everybody that isn't Muslim. I feel sorry for the folks that are duped by that silly idea. They need the gospel. We need to get, try to get it to them. Okay? Maybe God's brought a bunch of them to America so we can win them to the Lord. But what Hitler did with his concentration camps and killing the Jews, I don't think it's possible to understand what Hitler did and why he did it until you see how evolution ties in. Hitler thought he was speeding up the process and doing the world a favor by getting rid of the inferior genes. He killed at least six million. I've been to Germany three times. I read lots of books about Hitler and the Holocaust just to keep my blood boiling. What Hitler did was a direct result of his belief in evolution. 
See, what you believe determines how you behave. He was just speeding up the process. Hitler held his rallies at Nuremberg. I stood on the spot where Hitler spoke all of his uh, rallies there in Nuremberg on that uh, granite mined out of Flossburg camp where I just had been a few hours earlier where all the Jews died trying to mine granite for Hitler's platform to stand on. Hitler tried to make the people look small. The individual is small and the cause was great. Had these massive rallies at the Nuremberg uh, arena there. You know, the, new, the environmental movement folks try to do the same thing. They try to make the individual look small and the cause look great. You know, people are expendable. We've got to save Mother Earth. <laughs> Doing the same thing with our kids today. Hitler knew full well you have to indoctrinate the young people. And the evolutionists have worked very hard to infiltrate our school system and thoroughly indoctrinate the young people. It's interesting, Hitler referred to the Jews as parasites in the body of nations. The abortionists refer to the unborn child as a parasite in the woman's body. Same language. Hitler, one of his justifications for uh, believing in evolution was the gill slits. We talk about that on video four, the idea that the embryo has gills made up by the German professor Ernst Haeckel. And that goes on, we can talk a lot more about that on get our video number four about how uh, abortion is murder based on the thinking that evolution is true. It's a crazy idea. Hitler said, this new state, Germany, will give its youth to no one. We're going to raise the youth the way we want them to be raised. There was a man in Skokie, Illinois that shot and killed a doctor. When they asked him, why did you kill this doctor? He said, because he's making blue tinted contact lenses for people and he's diluting the Aryan beauty. Folks, the Aryan supremacy idea is not dead. There are still white supremacists all over the country. And I know I'm in the South. <laughs> well, get over it, okay? Nobody's better because of the color of their skin. Right. Hitler tried to hide behind the idea that Christianity justified what he was doing. This excellent book by Marvin Lutzer at uh, Moody Bible Press on Hitler's cross about how he tried to make people think it's okay because God had told him to kill all these people. Hitler, one of his propaganda pictures showed him walking out of a church with a cross over his head. He was a liar. Do you know they had Nazi baptisms? Hitler secretly, though, hated Christianity. He said, I regard Christianity as the most fatal seductive lie that ever existed because Christianity teaches all nations are of one blood. You're not better than anybody because of the color of your skin. That's what Christianity teaches. But they had Nazi baptisms, Nazi altars. Just unreal what Hitler did trying to hide behind the guise of Christianity. Now, the Japanese also thought that they were a superior race. The Japanese textbooks taught their kids for 30 or 40 years. When, when, when Darwin's book came out in 1859, when it was translated to Japanese several years later, the Japanese bought it up like crazy and said, wow, this is a perfect theory. They sucked it right in because it goes right along with the religions they already had there in Japan. And they said, wow, one race is superior. I bet it's the Japanese. They had special studies where they studied people and they said the Japanese don't have as much hair on their body, which proves they've ascended further from the apes. And they said they have a mild, milder body odor and they were the superior race that deserved to rule the world. People say, when I, when I say, I think evolution is largely responsible for World War II, they look at me like I'm nuts. But folks, that's exactly the case. Evolution is also the foundation philosophy for the New World Order. We cover lots on this on our college class, uh, CSE 103, where my 17-hour seminar is stretched out to 60 hours, where we chased every rabbit and kicked every dog that walked by. <laughs> that's a whole lot of stuff on our college course there. The United Nations has plans for a one-world government. The United Nations wants to establish a UN military force that can intervene in inter internal events in any country. They want to eliminate the veto power of the United States. They want to give the UN jurisdiction over the Earth Commons. That means the United Nations decides who owns, you know, the rivers and everything, everything in Earth. This is from a speech given by the Secretary General in September of 2000. They've already divided up the world into ten regions. You know, for years I was taught the European Roman, the old Roman Empire is going to be revived in the last days and we're going to have the ten, you know, the, the vision in the book of Daniel. Ten kings are going to get together and give their power to one king. And then I think we've been maybe missing something here, brother. Maybe it's not ten countries in Europe going to unite. Maybe it's ten regions of the world. Maybe this last vision of Daniel was the whole world uniting. They are making plans for a new world order. There are some extremely wealthy, powerful people making plans to rule the world. Like Pinky and the Brain. <laughs> They're out there trying to take over the planet. And God's up in heaven laughing about it. Psalms chapter 2. 
The psalmist said, Why do the heathen rage? The people imagine vain things. The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. God sees all their plans for a one world government and He's laughing about it. Now, in the meantime, I think we're going to have to go through, through some really hard times down here, folks. People say, well, God's going to get us out of here before the tribulation. Oh, tell that to the Chinese Christians and the Russian Christians and the Egyptian Christians that have been killed here and those in Sudan where they've killed hundreds of thousands in Africa just because they're Christians just in the last 10 or 15 years. Boy, if any country ever deserved the judgment of God, it's America. Amen. And I think it's coming soon to a city near you. The United Nations has plans to tax the world. They want to, we'll be paying a tax if they have their way, to the United Nations. They want to get the UN authority to regulate international commerce. They want to control food. They understand full well that the production and distribution of food is the way to control the world. The United Nations has plans to establish a new seat of power in the UN called the People's Assembly. It'll consist of representatives from nations, but also representatives from non-government organizations. Just organizations can be, have a seat in there. Interesting. They want to have jurisdiction over all, non, over all nation states. They certainly want to have jurisdiction over all the churches. And many churches have already stuck their head in the noose by becoming incorporated. And they don't realize what they've done. There's a good book if you want to read more on that. You can get it from our website, right, or right here in our bookstore, In Caesar's Grip, about how the incorporation process, 501c3, has trapped churches where they cannot speak out on certain topics. Man, 100 years ago, the politicians were scared stiff of the pastors because they just get up there and preach. You know, Senator Jones is a whoremonger. <laughs> well, today, if you talk about politics, they'll jerk your 501c3 status. And so Christians say, well, we can't talk about certain topics in the pulpit. Well, then you're not serving God. Right. If you're a prophet of God, you, tell, you say what God told you to say. If it hair lips the devil, then tough. <laughs> it goes back to the two basic philosophies of government. You know, evolution based on man's opinion and creation based on laws come from the Creator. He gives us rights to have churches. He gives us rights to speak, our, to speak the truth. Our founding father said, we, when it comes in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the bands which have connected them to another. They said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their Creator with certain rights. They kept talking about the right of the people because of the fact they were created by God. When you get a bunch of people together who believe they were created, they don't make good slaves. They're going to throw the tea in the harbor and start a big war. And so the guys who would like a new world order are fighting very hard to not let creation into the schools because the schools are their primary method of teaching their evolution theory, which says rights come from government, not from God. This fellow said, fundamentalists have no, fundamentalist parents have no right to indoctrinate their children in their beliefs. We are preparing their children for the year 2000 in life in a global one world society and those children will not fit in. They want to prepare our kids for a new world order. And boy, it's working folks. 75% of kids from Christian homes that go to secular schools lose their faith after one year of college. There's a great book called The Medusa File by Craig Roberts, excellent book on the government cover-ups of all sorts of things that have been covered up. Did you know how many prisoners of war were left behind when we fought World War II, when we fought in the Japanese theater, and when we fought Vietnam? Those prisoners of war were taken off to be um, coal miners up in the Soviet Union and in China. They just disappeared into slave labor camps. And some leaders in our government knew about it and said, oh, it's not worth messing with, just let them go. There are some still alive over there. Read this book, The Medusa File, if you want to get more on that. If you want to understand the conspiracy that's right now Satan is using to control the world, there are so many good books you can read about this. I've got several on the table here. There are different groups with their smoke-filled rooms trying to control the world. There's a meeting, <coughs> there's a committee of uh, 300 Jewish financiers, all masters of lodges, who rule the world according to Protocols of Zion. Now I get crit criticized for recommending the Protocols of Zion. I understand the book was written so that it would, if it was found, it would be blamed on the Jews. It's actually the bankers. But they kept calling it, they said, wrote it as if the Jews are going to do this and the Jews are going to do that. I tell you what, you read it. It's all, come, it's all come true in the last hundred years. And people say, that's a bad book, Brother Hovind. 
Well, yeah, it is, but it, it reveals their plan for the world, but it was not written by Jews. It was written by financiers, moneylenders. It shows their plan to rule the world. There's a book called The Committee of 300, showing the 300 top people who really make the decisions on this planet to decide when we're going to have a war and when we're going to have a depression and a recession. You get more on that. See, a lot of these crises that we face are man-made, intentionally made. I don't know if you saw the video of the airplane flying into the Twin Towers, but there's a video on the internet you can watch showing an F-15 flying right beside it, guiding them into the Twin Towers. You got to they slow the tape down and show it frame by frame. Interesting. I'm not sure what all happened that day, folks. I'm not sure if anybody's sure what all happened that day. But they will develop a crisis just so they can get their goals accomplished. Some of these guys would like a new world order, a one world government, and they're not against killing three or four thousand people if it helps their cause. Like blow up the Oklahoma City building just so we can, you know, eliminate the militia groups that are getting a little out of hand, you know? Or just so we can get more homeland security measures. I can't even carry my pocket knife on the plane now. <laughs> well, the Civil War was deliberately done in order to get more toward a one world government. So was World War I. The 1929 Depression was deliberately caused to get people to come in and get a social security number, which, by the way, is a voluntary system. The Cuban Missile Crisis was deliberate. See, the, the Russians, they have a technique. They say, we'll take two steps forward and one step back, and everybody thinks we retreated. They wanted a missile base. They wanted a military base in Cuba. So they put in a military base and missiles. Kennedy huffed and puffed about the missiles, you know, the big missile crisis in 62, and they took the missiles out, we think, and left the military base. Two steps forward, one step back, they're further toward the goal. They've done that all over the world. Oklahoma City was blown up by apparently some terrorists, obviously, but it wasn't the truck bomb in the street that blew that building up, folks. There's a whole lot more to it than that. You want to get a hold of Ben Parton, the Air Force uh, general in charge of explosives. He said, I know what blows buildings up. I've been doing this for 30 years. He said a truck bomb did not blow up that building. There were bombs in the basement around the pillars, sheared the pillars off. Talk to Ben Pardon. There's his phone number right there. If you don't believe me, he got a great videotape about that. In order to get anti-terrorism legislation passed that had been stalled in Congress, that's why I think those buildings came down. The TWA bombing was done deliberately to get rid of some people who were going to go testify against Bill Clinton, apparently. <clears throat> There's been so many conspiracies, and I read all this stuff and listen to all these things and see, read lots of books on it, but folks, it doesn't matter in a bigger sense. I think we as Christians need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I'm going to share with you tonight what I think the solution is. What, what should we be doing in light of the fact that there's a new world order coming down upon us and Christians are not going to be welcome? This fellow said, we're on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. I'll tell you what, when they're bombing your cities, people will give up their rights in order for safety. I think it was Ben Franklin said, those who will give up their rights for peace and security will have neither peace nor security. <clears throat> Bible says, this know also in the last days perilous times shall come. Folks, there are bad times coming. I'm not going to get up here and say, everything's going to be fine. I feel like something good's about to happen to you. <laughs> I feel like something bad's about to happen to everything. Okay, get ready. I got two grandkids, more coming. I'm just, I'm not excited about bad times coming, but folks, it's coming. That's right. What they do, they think of some excuse to create a crisis so the president can declare martial law, which of course sets aside the Constitution. Presidents are now actually ruling by executive order. There have been 13,000 of these given. Abraham Lincoln gave the first one ever in America, ordering 75,000 troops to invade the South. As it was Lincoln's War, not the Civil War. Another long story on that one. We cover that on seminar on a uh, college class, CSE 103. What they'll do, these rich folks will get in their mind what they want to accomplish, and how to get more control over the world, and then they, they develop a crisis to get people to do what they want. They are laying plans for a one world government. And now, the presidents, ruling by executive orders, have totally bypassed the Constitution. We could talk for hours on the executive orders. I've got a list of quite a few of them here. In case of an emergency, though, they have the authority to take over all food supplies, take over all vehicles. If your vehicle is state registered, they can come take it if they want it. Commandeer your vehicle. They can take away all the American people for workforces. They have to take over all the health, education, and welfare facilities. Take over all the airports. Register all men and women for the draft. Force relocation centers. Take over all the railroads, inland waterways, storage facilities. FEMA is going to provide the muscle to do this. 
the Federal Emergency Management Act. Those are the guys to watch, the ones that make me real nervous. They're going to be the enforcers. See, no dictator can really do anything without somebody to enforce his will on the people. Hitler never shot anybody, but people did. On March 17, 2003, George Bush told the Iraqi soldiers to disobey if they're given orders to use poison gas or set the wells on fire, didn't he? How many heard that? He said, you guys are going to be judged as war criminals if you do these things after we win. Want to listen carefully. Soldiers, some of you are in the military here. You took an oath to defend the Constitution against enemies foreign and domestic. Is that right? What if the domestic enemy is your boss? Who's your authority to? Who's your elite? Is it to God? It's going to be a tough time for Christian soldiers. They're going to have to make a decision to stand up and say, okay, I'm going to do what God says. Sometimes there are conflicts between authorities. Kids know this. They try to get mom to say one thing and dad to say another. Try to create a conflict in the authority chain, right? Kids are good at that. Well, God's the ultimate authority. And if I was a soldier, I would serve my country and I would obey orders until there was an order to disobey something God had said to do. That's where you draw the line. I'm sorry, I just simply can't do that, sir. I refuse. You say, they're going to court-martial me. Oh, so money's more important than uh, God's will, huh? <laughs> That's what it boils down to. That sometimes it is always right to disobey evil orders. Many of you took an oath to defend this Constitution. Now, do it. Tyrants cannot succeed without enforcers. Hitler never shot anybody. He told people to do it, and they did it for him. Okay, who's doing all this, and why, and what are we supposed to do about it? There are many people involved in the plans for the new world order. We have the United Nations. We have the World Council of Churches. We have the Council of Foreign Relations. You want to get more on that? You want to read the, and a lot of these books are referenced on my website, where you can get more information on these books that are, uh, if you want to go down deep on these topics. There's the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, the International Bankers, the Club of Rome, the Communists, the Socialists, the National Education Association, NEA, very much involved. And by the way, teachers, if you're a teacher in a public school, get out of the NEA. Quit paying them your dues. Don't support them. You should read the stuff that they support and that they're for. If you're a Christian and you love God and you're a public school teacher, quit the NEA. You say, but I won't get insurance. There are other places to get insurance, for one thing. Number two, money doesn't dictate right and wrong. If it does, you got a problem. <laughs> you do what's right. God takes care of it from there. Okay? Get out of that place. Get out of that club. Okay? The NOW, National Organization for Wild Women. The ACLU, the American Communist Lawyers Union. Uh, the Masonic Lodge. I had a guy in our church came to me and said, Brother Hovind, I've been in the Masonic Lodge for years. I don't see anything wrong with it. I said, Brother, would you go home and read this book, Masonry Beyond the Light? Just read this book. Bring it back and we'll talk. He brought it back two weeks later and said, well, I quit the lodge and I've got four of my other brothers to quit the lodge also, brother. Thank you so much for giving me that book. Most of the guys that I know in the Masonic Lodge, including some very close friends of mine, don't really have a clue what they're in. They don't realize until they get to the top. It's a satanic organization. I'll show you. Here's the oath. Uh, well, General Pike said, that which we must say to the crowd is, we worship a god, but it's a god that one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign grand inspectors general, we say this, that you may repeat it to the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us, initiates of the higher degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. Less, yes, Lucifer is God. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. And before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly handle energy. You can read Scarlet and the Beast if you want to go down real deep on the Masonic Lodge, or this one, Beyond the Light. You can get it from Chick Publications or call our office. We can get you one. The Bible says we're not supposed to swear at all, right? Have you read the Masonic Oath that they swear? This is just the first one. They go through many oaths in this process. They say, I, put their name in there, do hereby swear that I will always conceal and never reveal any of the secrets of Freemasonry to any person. If I do, I consent to having my throat cut from ear to ear, my tongue torn out by the roots, my berry body buried in the sands of the sea at low water mark. Can you imagine Jesus saying something like that? Have we gone nuts? The Bible says, swear not at all. Get out of that club. Just quit, okay? Quit supporting them. 
If you got all that free time on your hands, go do something around the church. Go win somebody to Christ. Amen. Jesus said, I've done nothing in secret. Why do they have their secret clubs, their secret handshakes, you know, where you hold the second knuckle, depending on what degree you're in, all these different secret handshakes, you know, and the secret way that they stand, you know, judge, put their hand like this, I'm in distress, you know, rescue me, judge. You know, the judge is probably a mason too. Or like this, you know, that's a sign of ultimate distress. You've got to rescue me. Every mason's obligated if they got their hands like this, making part of a square. Joseph Smith, the leader of the Mormon, uh, Mormon church, when he was being shot outside the Carthage jail, did like this, hoping there were some masons in the crowd. I had two Mormon, or about six Mormon missionaries, I guess, lived down the street from me in California. I went there to visit them one time to their house, trying to win them to the Lord. I will witness them to them, brother. And I got there kind of early in the morning, I guess, for them, 10 o'clock. I thought it was not too early, but they had their holy underwear on. <laughs> I'd never seen it. I'd heard about it, but I'd never seen it before. They come to the door, got their holy underwear. It's got a Masonic Lodge symbol over each nipple and one on each on the thigh. They're not allowed to ever have all the underwear off at the same time because the demons can get them. So when they take a shower, they leave their underwear on one leg, take a shower on half their body, put it on the other leg, and take a shower on the other half of their body. Talk about dumb. <laughs> it's not holy underwear, okay? You should see how Joseph Smith went just near to the top of the Masonic Lodge in one day. The Mormons and the Masons are all tied in together, folks. February 2nd, 33rd day of the year, by the way, is the first high day of the Satanic churches. 1933, by the way, call it Groundhog Day. Do it over and over and over till you get it right. Maybe you saw the movie Groundhog, all right? 1933, Roosevelt passed the War Powers Act. He ordered all private gold turned into the government. Rockefeller helped set up Adolf Hitler in 1933, financed Adolf Hitler to come to power because we needed another war so Rockefeller could make some more money. These guys make money off these wars, folks. We could talk a long time about the Masons and their tie into this, but just get our videotape, uh, uh, for CSE 103. There are so many good books you can read about what's going on. Uh, uh, en Route to Global Occupation by Gary Ka, excellent book, The New World Order by William Still, who writes a lot on the Federal Reserve also, tremendous book. Angels Don't Play This Harp, about the harp technology, High Altitude Aurora Research Project, how they're using microwaves to bounce them off the cloud of the uh, uh, high altitude uh, atmosphere and create virtual lenses and steer weather, direct weather patterns. You know, make a country have a famine just by using High Altitude Aurora Research Project. You want to read up on that? Uh, we could talk all night about that, but uh, it's just See our website, we've got a whole list of recommended books if you want to read more. Satan is the one who's deceiving the world. Right. These individual people are not the enemy. God loves them and they can be saved. Anybody can be forgiven for their sin. But there's a battle coming, folks. Satan's been working hard to get people to work for him. And there are now military forces that it'd be pretty hard to uh, fight against. The Bible says, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? The New World Order folks have a goal to reduce the population to one half billion as soon as possible. You watch. I think it'll happen in the next, who knows, in my lifetime for sure, probably in the next few years. We're going to see the population of the earth radically reduced through whatever means, vaccines, wars, pestilence, famine, just like the Bible predicted. Read Revelation. It's all in there. Wooster said, people are the cause of all the problems. We need to get rid of some of them. Jacques Cousteau said we need to eliminate 350,000 people today to save Mother Earth. Ted Turner said we need a 95% decline in population. Okay, Ted, you first. <laughs> Bill Clinton signed the Biodiversity Treaty, which said we need to reduce the human population to one billion. Well, Bill, a lot of folks wouldn't miss you. Go ahead, man. Prince Philip, the husband of Queen Elizabeth, she's the one that invented the microwave. You'll get that later. Prince Philip said, if I could be reincarnated, I would wish to return to Earth as a killer virus to lower human population levels. I think they're going to put viruses in the vaccines and give them to these third world countries and wipe them out. I think it's already been doing, or already been going on. Okay, what do we do? The world's a mess. We're going to see the end of it. It's going to get really bad really soon. What do we do? We should do exactly what Jesus told us to do 2,000 years ago. He said, go ye into all the world, teach, them, teach all nations, baptize them, get them saved, and then teach them to go do the same thing. You know, Jesus lived under Roman control. So, go win, go win souls. The Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We need to know what to do. Today what we need are some men and women of understanding to tell us what to do. In the book of Proverbs it says, 
By a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. We need somebody who understands what to do. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, Take wise men and understanding, and known among the tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. Solomon said, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart, that I may judge, discern between good and bad. The Bible says Abigail was a woman of good understanding. And beautiful, that don't hurt, you know, but she was, she was good understanding, okay? She knew what to do. In the book of Ezra, it says they sent for all these guys, you know, Eliezer and etc., men of understanding. By the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding. The men of Issachar were men of understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. We need some pastors to be men of understanding to know what they ought to do. We need some dads to understand what's going on and understand what you ought to do with your family. Dads, that's your family. You're, you're going to be stand before God one of these days and be judged for how they turn out. Take command of the situation. People, people say, oh, my kids won't obey. Are you feeding them still? <laughs> Are you clothing them? Are you giving them a place to, place to sleep? Hey, if they're going to sleep under my roof and eat my food, they're going to do what I say. Amen. Period. <laughs> okay. My three kids all turned out serving the Lord, all working for me in my ministry. Now, they're not perfect by a long shot. But they can tell you, boy, when Dad said it, he meant it. <laughs> this is the way it's going to be, son. You're not going to do that in my house. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> I'm paying the bills. You know, as soon as you want to take over the bills, then you can take over the control. Meanwhile, shut your mouth. <laughs> I think it's time to get motivated, folks. There's a real serious problem coming, looming on the horizon. We're going to see real serious trouble in America. What do we do? Well... The first mention of Caesar in the Bible is in Matthew 22, 17. Tell us, therefore, what thou thinkest. Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Hmm. Jesus was born under Caesar's control. What did he do? He ignored them. Just go win souls. So Twelve things we need to do. Number one, you need to realize God's in control. He's the potter. We are the clay. Shut up. Sit still. Let him do something with you. Okay? Be still and know that He is God. Let Him put you where He wants you and make out of you what he wants, whatever He wants to make out of you. He's the potter. Number two, be wise as serpents. I think we stick our head in a lot of nooses and let them hang us. And we could talk a long time about all the different ways that we have created a nexus of relationship with the government. Churches do that by getting 501c3. People do that by getting marriage licenses and driver's licenses and social security numbers and on and on and on. We cover all that on our CSE class 103. Number three, be careful for nothing. Careful means full of care. I see people that are worried and nervous. Wow, what's going to happen? The New World Order's coming. They're going to come kill everybody. Well, go, go win some souls. <laughs> Number four, pray for those in authority. We're his children. Obey his orders. Preach the gospel. Be the salt of the earth. Salt irritates. Some of these Christians are so worried about offending somebody. <laughs> Who cares? I want to please God. Nothing else is going to matter, folks. Use your influence. Everybody has influence. Some of you ought to get on the school board. I hear people say, well, Christians shouldn't get involved in politics. Oh, tell that to King David, King Solomon. <laughs> Daniel, he was involved in politics. I mean, read your Bible. Of course we ought to get involved, right? We need to teach the truth about creation. You know, in Acts chapter 17, there are only two great sermons in the book of Acts. Acts 2, Peter preached on Pentecost, spoke in one language. They heard him in 17 languages, an amazing miracle. And he spoke, and he quoted verse after verse after verse. The Jews were familiar with Bible verses. But in Acts 17, Paul preached on Mars Hill to the heathen. He didn't quote one Bible verse. Imagine preaching a whole sermon without one Bible verse. He just said, God that made the world, he talked about creation. And folks, if we're going to reach America, it's going to have to be using the creation message to reach them. The textbooks are teaching the evolution story. The textbooks in Escambia County, right here, are teaching the kids the evolution story. They learned it today. They're going to learn it again tomorrow. This textbook says, Life arose from non-living matter present on the early earth. Does that agree with what the Bible says? No. Did we pay for that to go in the classrooms in this town? Yes. <laughs> Doesn't that bother anybody? Oh, the earth is 4.5 billion years old. The oldest fossils are 3.5 billion years old. 
Eukaryotes evolved from prokaryotes about one and a half billion years ago. They just teach it like it's a fact, folks. There's a war going on. Get involved. Do something. If a kid goes to 12 to 16 years to school in this town with, what, over 200 churches in Pensacola, how's he going to view the world? Well, if he believes what he's taught in the textbook, he's going to believe in evolution. Number nine, don't get distracted. Satan's a master at distracting us on absolutely dumb things that don't matter. How many have seen a mobile? You put it over the crib and you wind it up, and the kid lays there and he goes, oh. <laughs> We get distracted so easily. Average American watches 1,500 hours of TV a year. That's enough time to read your Bible 22 times. Now, I don't think you ought to sit around and read the Bible all the day long, you know, but you ought to read it some. The Bible said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Do you put wicked things in front of your eyes? Folks, we're wicked. That's why we got all this government bureaucracy over us. The Bible says, for the transgressions of the land, many are the princes thereof. That's why we got all these bureau bureaucrats, <laughs> because we're wicked. The Bible says, righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, here's the solution right here. God told Solomon, if my people which are called by my name, shall vote Republican, start a militia, store up revival, I mean, store up survival foods. Is that what he said? No. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. Hey, dads, when's the last time your kids saw you humble yourself? When's the last time they saw you at the altar praying for somebody? When's the last time they saw you crying for lost souls? When's the last time they saw you fast and pray to, in order to get somebody saved? When's the last time? Shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn off their wicked TVs. Or no, uh, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Folks, America needs to be healed. We've got serious problems. God gave us the solution, and we're not doing it. I don't see it. Preacher, you see it? I think we're going to get what we deserve. <laughs> we're just going to get it. Little David was sent off to help his brothers. You know, they were fighting the war over there. Little David came up to the battle and gave him some cheese and raisins and stuff, and he saw Goliath out there. And David said, hey, why don't you, one of you guys go beat him up? And his oldest brother said, hey, go home and take care of the sheep, man, you little punk. Get out of here. And David said, is there not a cause? <laughs> Wow, what a verse. Is there not a cause? Hey, what's your cause? I don't know what happened to me, brother, but about 14 years ago, I just got bit with this bug that this is the greatest cause there is. Preaching the gospel, winning folks, and evolution is the greatest obstacle, so let's just tackle it head on. Let's chop right at the root of the tree. Evolution is the philosophy behind all sorts of evil things going on. Let's just go right for the root. What cause do you live for? Is this it? Sports. Oh, wow, he can throw the ball through the hoop. Ooh, oh, <laughs> who's going to care in a thousand years? Does anybody know who won the Super Bowl 10 years ago? Does anybody care? Doesn't matter. All those grown men out there fighting over that one ball, they can all afford to go buy their own. <laughs> It's not sinful, it's just stupid. You pay a guy $5 million to carry a pig bladder down a cow pasture. I mean, come on. <laughs> Get all them big lugs out of the way and I'll carry it down there for you. You know, <laughs> We've gone nuts. The Bible says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. And the people that have millions of dollars, do you know what they want? More. The people that have 50 pairs of shoes in their closet, you know what they want? More shoes. The people that have a big house, you know what they want? Bigger house. People that have a fast car, you know what they want? Gas. Faster. I guess, yeah, true. <laughs> it takes us a whole lifetime to figure out things in this world do not satisfy. People that play golf, you know, five hours a week, you know what they want? Oh, six hours a week. Seven, eight, nine. Hey, did you know if you spend thousands of hours practicing at golf, Get the grip just right, you know, shoulders curled. This thumb and finger make a V, pointed toward this shoulder. Same thing over here. Knee slightly bent, shoulders curled. 
club face perpendicular to the ball, bend the right elbow first. If you practice for thousands of hours, someday you will be able to knock a ball into a hole in the dirt. <laughs> and the angels rejoiced. Oh. <laughs> we have gone nuts. The Bible says, seek those things which are above. Set your affection on things above. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's not of the Father, it's of the world. And the world passeth away. I remember when I was working at General Motors, working my way through college. Every night we'd put together 250 some trucks. Assembly line, you know, come by, put, do my thing. Another one comes by, we do my thing to the truck. And I thought, you know, everything I'm doing here is going to burn. It's all going to burn. When we were working at M&A together, Brother Building Cabinets, we worked hard, had a good job, but I said, you know, this is all going to burn. It's all going to burn. I want to invest my life in something that's going to last forever. Get our videotape on how to make money and spend it God's way. See the way you really ought to spend your money. Number 10, listen for the trumpet. The Bible says, The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of God, the trumpet of the ark, but the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Southern Baptists, go first. But hey, we're going next, okay? And then, I pick on the Southern Baptists a lot. I, I, used to, I speak in a lot of their churches too, and I'm Baptist myself. Uh, we're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Listen for the trumpet, folks. It's coming soon. Number 11, win souls. The last mention of Caesar is right here. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. You say, oh, they're going to send troops in and can occupy America. Oh, good. Go witness to them. They sent troops in to occupy Israel, didn't they? What did the disciples do? Led them to Christ. I don't think the disciples sat around worrying about, oh, did you know the Romans are going to send another thousand troops to Bethlehem? Oh, really? Hey, get some more tracks, guys. Let's go. That's got to be the attitude we take. He that winneth souls is wise. During a civil war, this big old country boy from Alabama signed up to go fight the war. Man, he's sick of them Yankees down here invading our territory, you know, so he got him a rifle, got him a backpack, and went off and joined the army. He showed up for battle, said, reporting for duty, sir. Sergeant said, son, we're glad you're here. Man, we need recruits bad. He said, son, your job is to guard this trench right here. Soldier said, Sarge, I didn't come to guard no trench. I come to fight Yanks, and they're right over there. Can I go fight them? He said, no, son, you don't understand. We're dug in, they're dug in, and we're waiting for orders. Guard the trench right here. So the old country boy started marching back and forth in the mud. You know, he's getting madder by the minute. He said, man, I didn't come here to march in the mud. I come to fight Yanks, and they're right over there. Why can't I go fight them? Finally, he worked himself up into a frenzy. He dropped everything, jumped up out of the trench, and ran screaming and yelling across no man's land straight for the Yankee trench. A one-man rebel charge. The Yanks were stunned. They thought, wow, this guy's trying to commit suicide. He ran all the way across no man's land, jumped into the Yankee trench, picked up the first Yankee he saw, and kaboom, knocked him out. One punch. He was a country boy. He'd been toting hay, you know. Kaboom, <laughs> knocked him out. Grabbed his prisoner climbed up out of the trench, and ran back for the rebel trench. Nobody dared shoot now. He jumped into the rebel trench, and all the rebs gathered around and said, What's that? He said, That's a Yankee. They said, Well, where'd you get him? He said, I got him over yonder. He said, Y'all could have had one if and you'd have wanted one. <laughs> There's a whole bunch more over there. Hey, you know what? I think one of these days we're going to get to heaven. And some people are going to have a crowd gathered around them that they influenced for God. Some of you Sunday school teachers have been faithful for years, and you've influenced thousands of people over time. You don't even know about some of them. Amen. And you're going to have a crowd of people gathered around you. And somebody else is going to walk up and say, where'd you get all them? you say, well, I got them down yonder on the earth. Y'all could have had one if and you'd have wanted one. What do you want? You want to win somebody to the Lord? Or do you want to find out who throws the ball through the hoop? It just, the longer I live, the less some of those things matter to me. When I was 16 years old, I gave my heart to the Lord. Got saved. I started going to independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating, Baptist church. <laughs> started reading my Bible, growing in the Lord. Boy, it was great. After about two or three months, a friend of mine said, Hey, Kent, 
Let's go to the heart of Illinois Fair. They've got a fair going on there, carnival, you know, and your, our job is from, as this uh, Christian organization is to try to get all these people saved at the fair. I said, I don't know how to get anybody saved. They said, well, don't worry about it. Just come with us. All you got to do is go out and do a survey in the crowd. Ask them a question. Would you like to get to know God better? If they say yes, you bring them to us and we'll show them how to get saved. I said, great. First night I went out there and I'm bringing folks back to the back of the tent, introducing them to the soul winner. I thought, this, this is good, man. This is fun. Third night, I believe, I'm out there talking to this big old football player and I said, hey, would you like to get to know God better? He said, yeah, I would. I said, come with me. We went to the back of the tent. I opened up the tent flap and there was nobody there. I later found out they had been down at the circus, you know. They'd been down talking to the Siamese twins and led one of them to Christ. <laughs> so the next night they went down there to disciple him and they started talking about, you know, one of these days the Lord's going to come and all the Christians are going to be taken out of here. And of course his brother's sitting right there. Hey, what's going to happen to me? Oh, you're going to have a problem, aren't you? <laughs> so he ended up getting saved too. I didn't know that all at the time. All I knew was I'm standing here with this big football player and there's nobody in the back. He said, what do we do now? I said, well, uh, I guess I'll show you. I was a brand new Christian, never showed anybody how to get saved in my life. I reached in my pocket and had a track, God's Four Spiritual Laws, one we used to use back then. We sat down in the chairs there in the dirt floor in the heart of Illinois Fair in the tent, and I read the whole track to him. I said, well, law one, you're a sinner, you deserve to go to hell, you know, Christ died for you. Went through the whole plan of salvation with God's Four Spiritual Laws. At the end, they had a prayer to pray. I said, would you like to receive Christ? You pray this prayer. He said, yeah, I'd like to receive Christ. I said, oh, brother, I got him on the hook and I can't land him. You know, what do I do now? I said, well, it says pray this prayer, so let's pray. We bowed our heads, closed our eyes. I kept one eye open and I read the prayer off that track. I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> I read the prayer to him. And he prayed and invited Christ to forgive his sins and save his soul that night. He stood up and he looked at me and said, Kent, I've been worried about this for two weeks now. Thanks so much for showing me. I said, you're welcome. First person I led to Christ. He walked out of the tent. Boy, it was a noisy carnival, no, you know, just a mess outside. I just got down on my knees by that metal chair in that dirt floor in the middle of that tent, all the hollering and yelling outside. I said, Lord, uh, it's me, it's Kent. I said, Lord, I've just been saved for a couple of months here. This is all new to me. I'm kind of confused. I said, I don't know what you want me to do with my life. But Lord, if it's okay with you, uh, I think I'd like to do this the rest of my life. I just want to bring people to Jesus. I don't know what's important to you. I don't know. But I tell you what drives me. I want to win souls. I want to influence others for Christ. I want to do this the rest of my life. People say, Brother Hovind, you travel so much. Oh, I know. Man, flew 175 times last year. Spoke nearly 800 times. Going to try to do more this year. They say, well, if you burn the candle at both ends, you know. Oh, yeah, I know. You get twice the light. I know. <laughs> Number 12. I re read the last chapter, folks. We win. Satan thinks he's going to set up his new world order. Don't worry about it. Christ is going to set up his new world order. We're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. The Bible says, The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He saw an angel come down from heaven having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. He shut him up. They would deceive the nations no more. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. That might be us, folks. We may have to get beheaded. Oh, well. Some people don't use theirs anyway. Wouldn't miss it. Right? <laughs> we're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Then we're going to see Satan cast into the lake of fire forever. You choose which side you want to be on. I choose the winning side. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst, Come. <laughs> Come, come to the Lord. If you're not saved, come to the Lord and let Him forgive your sins. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. If we can be any help, our ministry exists to help strengthen your faith in the Word of God. Or, if you're not a Christian, we want to get you saved. That's what we're here for.
give us a call. You can get one of our catalogs. Our material is not copyrighted purposely. Come down and see our bookstore if you're in Pensacola, or get one of our videotapes if you're not, or come see our Dinosaur Adventure Land. Man, you want to have a fun time. We're having a blast. We don't really have a plan. Someday we'd like to sell the lawnmower once everything gets covered with buildings, you know, but basically that's the plan. <laughs> we just want to influence people for the Lord. Find something to do. Hey, if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, it's so simple. You and I are sinners. We deserve to die and go straight to hell for our sin, according to Romans 3.23. If God sent us to hell tonight, it would be exactly what we deserve. But in spite of the fact that God's angry with the wicked every day, He loves you and He wants you to come to heaven. But He's not going to bring you like you are. You've got to come through Christ or you're not coming. So February 9, 1969, a friend of mine said, Kent, you're a sinner. I said, I know that. He said, you deserve to go to hell. I said, yep, I know that too. He said, but Jesus died in your place. That's why he died on the cross, to pay for your sin. And if you'd like to receive him as your Savior right now, you can take him and he'll take you. I thought, wow, what a deal. I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell, but I want you to forgive me and save me right now. And on that day, I accepted Christ as my Savior. You could do the same thing. There's no magic words. Just get off by yourself and just say something like, Lord, would you please forgive me? God, be merciful to me. I deserve to go to hell. Forgive me and save me. And then write this date down in your Bible because this is your spiritual birthday. The Bible says, As many as receive him, John 1, 12, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. John 3 says you must be born again to go to heaven. Well, that's how you get born again. As soon as you receive Christ, poof, you're born again. Now you're one of God's kids. Which means he won't send you to hell. He might take you to heaven early if you don't straighten up, you know, but he won't, he won't send you to hell. See, some of God's kids, he takes them home and crowns them. Others, he crowns them and takes them home. That's your choice, okay? <laughs> but uh, well, once my kids got into my family, I was stuck with them. Once you get into God's family, you're, you're stuck, okay? Now, that doesn't mean, you know, you won't get by with things. He may judge you. There's a sin unto death. You know, you can commit sins as a Christian and God will kill you but he won't send you to hell. He gave you eternal life, not temporary life. We'll cover all that some other time. If we can be any help, please give us a call. Our phone number and address and website and stuff will come up on the, scene, on the uh, uh, screen here. We want to help strengthen your faith. In video tape number six, we're gonna talk about the flood when God judged this world. What caused the flood in the days of Noah? Then on tape seven, we go through th over three hours of questions and answers. Things like, where do the races come from? What about carbon dating? What about starlight? How did the, all, we, 60-some questions we try to answer on there on videotape number seven. We want to help try to answer questions to set the record straight. God's Word is true, and if you're not saved, you're going to hell, whether you believe it or not. But you can be forgiven and go to heaven if you'll accept Christ as your Savior. Thank you so much.